We've seen already that Ding Liren won the final of the Grand Chess Tour, defeating Maxime Vashilikov. So what happened in the third place playoff? Well, let's check out the match between Magnus Carlsen and Levon Aronian. And I want to look at the first classical game that they played. This was a really heavyweight strategic struggle full of interesting maneuvers, some sharp tactics and well let's see what happened at the end. So Carlson with the white pieces and he plays this London system with Bishop F4. Well this is just one of the openings that he likes to try out now and again and Aronian seizes the chance to put a more another pawn in the middle basically so you know this is a very uh, principled setup um, so black you could say almost has a slight space advantage but okay the the normal move here is to play e6 um, but instead of running plays a different system very interesting he exchanges and now we have a, a pawn structure which, which is very like a Karakon exchange variation or uh, basically it's a Queen's Gambit exchange variation reversed if, if that makes sense okay more more on that later um, well it's not a bad idea to bring this bishop out bishop f5 is a good move claiming this diagonal stopping the bishop coming to d3 but Aronian plays another interesting move queen b6 threatening two pawns so the only way to save one of the, the, the pawns is to play knight b3 and that's slightly dragged this knight um, offside. Nevertheless, there are ways in which white can use that knight on b3 to his advantage. Um, here, well, bishop b2 is normal, but instead, here we go, a4. So Carlson is using that knight well to gain some space on the queen side with a5, and that can actually restrict black's queenside counterplay because very often later on in the game once the queen has moved you want to advance that b pawn so a4 is just gaining some space and if that's blocked then the bishop finds a nice square on b5 so you can see that there are often you know there are little subtleties about for example not developing that bishop on f1 at an early stage with bishop d3 so it's come out to b5 in one move. So Aronian plays a6 to make sure that, that pawn goes so far but no further and then puts the queen on a7 so it's a little bit unusual. But I think Magnus would have been pretty happy to see that pawn there. Now this bishop is a superb piece and that's why Aronian plays knight h5 just to nudge that bishop off the diagonal. Um, I'm, I have a feeling that, well, Carlson spent a bit of time here. I'm feeling he might have been looking at bishop c7 and playing that bishop round to b6. That's actually a very interesting idea. But bishop b3 played more orthodox. And now the queen is allowed out. And h3. Now that's a good move from Carlson because it forces black to make a decision about the bishop on g4 while uh, yeah tactically basically you've got to take on f3 here. So if the bishop goes back to f5 then g4 forks the two pieces. So black takes and the knight has to go back because if if knight f4 which is well could be a potentially a nice square then h4 is a, is a good move and we're ready either to play h5 and leave that knight looking maybe not, not the best square or, or simply g3 and h5 um that's unpleasant so the knight basically has to go back to f6 so well aronian has lost some time there but he has managed to actually well stake a claim to this diagonal which is a very important part in in this position and here is where um, Carlson has a big decision to make actually because 
he well the, the the move that he makes next will basically determine his middle game strategy and here he decides to play the bishop around to d3 which is uh, well, a, a very fine square for the bishop as we'll see but he could have gone in a very different way for example if he'd castled here and then simply gone knight c5 and i rather like this actually it's a very straightforward way of playing so white wants to follow up with b4 and if this is taken then well we're going to play b4 anyway and well it's an unusual situation with two knights against two bishops but it's hard for black to actually advance these center pawns because they could very easily come under fire personally i would prefer white in that position but you know it's double edged and there's another way to play which is to play bishop g5 push that knight away and then go for c4 because this bishop well it's just biting on that rock of a center pawn but if we can soften up that diagonal then it might be interesting so you can see how these are very different ways of playing big decision but Carlson decides to put the bishop on d3 looking in these directions so very often black will want to play b6 but you can see how the bishop is pointing on a6 so it makes it more difficult for black to achieve that break successfully both sides castle finally and queen c7 so that connects the rooks very important before we do anything and rook e1 so carlson likes fixed pawn structures that we see in many many games of his where and that means that he can maneuver his pieces very nicely without fearing some kind of dynamic thrust but carlson has to watch out for two things here one is the b6 pawn break opening the b file and the other is the e5 pawn break which again would uh, well really free black's pieces of course there are minuses to both these breaks that this pawn could become weak and this pawn could also become weak but that's what Carlson has to guard against over the next few moves so we have some very interesting shuffling going on at this moment from both players so here for example what what about b6 well this could be taken now of course we don't want to move the, the knight straight away because that pawn hangs but bishop c2 holds everything together for the time being and that should be okay for white you know it would be nice to be able to double on the a file to put some pressure here and that would guard the b2 pawn but levon plays rook e8 so you can see how he could be angling for this move building up behind the pawn but bishop g5 now we see the reason why the king was put to h8 because after this move the knight can drop back to g8 and it wants to redeploy to the g6 square where it blocks out any white attack and still looks at coming into f4 potentially we'll watch out for the checkmate i didn't miss it don't worry um, but later on and e5 potentially is an option bishop c2 now that's actually again directed potentially against b6 because this is protected by the way i like rookie two a few moves ago because that protected the b2 pawn it's also leaving the d3 square clear for potentially this maneuver at some moment got to watch out for the a pawn though so this is very subtle stuff around here king g8 yeah the king wasn't too good on h8 but it comes back now bishop d2 well you've got to watch out for this move sometimes um, so the bishop comes back here but actually what happens if bishop f4 so here's an interesting moment well in principle black would like to exchange bishops get rid of that bishop pair but actually in this case you can see that now the pressure is off the a5 pawn that knight comes to this beautiful outpost followed up by b4 and well white is in control there but white is definitely getting something so knight b4 
So if pawn takes, then queen takes bishop. So bishop goes back, and the knight has to go back. And then bishop d3. So a bit of shuffling going on here. What about e5? Is this break dangerous? Well, it's the move that Carlson has to consider around here on every move. This and b6. So what happens? Well, in fact, there's a slight problem here. Because there's a pin. So this pawn can't advance further, which it would, it would like to, because we just take here. And that bishop can't be taken because of the pin on the e-file. So back we go. So rook b8 from Aronian. So he could be angling for b6, but let's see. Bishop b3. Okay, that straightens things out a little bit. It means the rook is protecting the pawn on b2 in case this break comes. Rook e8. Okay, still got to watch out for that one. g3. In principle, a nice move. Taking away the f4 square from black's pieces. So here, well, let's check out these breaks again. b5, we can take and play knight c5. That looks nice and start to target this pawn. e5, well, that's possible, but after this, you can see that this pawn is potentially a problem once the bishop comes back and rook d1, and white is solid enough on the king side with that pawn. So Levon waits, he puts the knight back to f8, and Magnus waits. But now he decides to go for it. Well. I mean, black could sit there, but white has ways to improve his position. You know, maybe bring the queen back, start advancing the h-pawn. There are things to do. Anyway, b6, so critical moment. It's clear that the struggle is turning towards the queen side. Now, you can see that knight shouldn't really move at the moment because that's on priest so therefore bishop c1 protecting the pawn and now the knight can hop into the outpost <clears throat> well if black plays a5 to secure the a pawn then the knight comes back to d3 now that is a very secure position for white so it's clear that this pawn is well defended Black can't disturb these, this strong pawn chain. That A pawn isn't going any further. That square is controlled. Actually, white is doing pretty well there. Black is stymied on the queen side. And you can start to turn your attention to the other side of the board. So Aronian decides, right, it's time to create chaos. One break here and now another break trying to undermine the position of the knight on c5 for now it just gets really chaotic so this is all about precise calculation now the knight attacks queen and rook however there is a slight problem for white in that there's a pin here so knight takes rook queen takes rook and well that seems fine for black so carlson took here Looks okay. G6. <clears throat> so the queen is going to have to move away from protecting that. But it swings across just in time to protect the knight. But it looks pretty scary. However, if knight, if rook a8, then knight c5. And white gets out of trouble there. You can see if queen takes... Well, we can play knight takes or rook takes, actually, in that in that case. And white's a pawn up. So, rook c8. Still really tricky. Now, you could play knight b4, but then queen b7 is a bit annoying. So, bishop e3. <clears throat> well, it's getting critical. d4. Not so clear. So, bishop takes... Now knight f3 check. Now here, actually, rook c4 is a good move. And the idea is this, that after b4, you can play here and take. And actually, black is going to pick up that pawn here. 
But well, there are, I mean, there are lots of other variations after rook c4. It is very, very tricky indeed. Um, instead, left one played knight f3 and then took here. Queen takes best move. So if rook takes knight, we can actually play queen takes queen. Knight e6 played. So still really complex position with all these threats and this strange pin here, this knight kind of dangling. Um, queen e3 is possible. And then we get this strange position. Then white will have to give this up. Still actually pretty unclear. Maybe white's better, but it's tricky. Instead, Carlson played, I think, a very pragmatic move. I think a good practical move. Rook takes knight, giving up the exchange. So now it's knight and two pawns against rook. So a rough balance, but that can tip either way. But maybe the most important thing, Carlson has control. Getting rid of that knight just kind of calms things down a little bit. Um, and white is, well, definitely has the advantage at this moment. It's also nice to be able to open up black's king a little bit as well. It's another practical consideration with that bishop on e4, white's king is absolutely secure. Rook a2 defends that pawn. Well, of course, it can't be taken at the moment anyway, but... And now Carlson goes through the exchange of queens and b4. So really, the only question now is whether black can survive. Here, he should have played rook c8. And there is, well, there are survival chances for black. But instead, rook b8 was a mistake. As with that pawn advancing, this is no fun at all. And now, rook c2, you can see this one threatens to advance. So Aronian gave back the exchange, but he only got one pawn in that little transaction. So basically Carlson is this pawn up. Now the fact that there are bishops of opposite color uh, here doesn't actually make much difference to the position. As long as the rooks stay on the board, then white still has, well, I was gonna say winning chances. I would say a winning position actually. It's very difficult to defend this. Because that pawn, obviously far advanced, well protected, but not just that. You know, they always say that in, in end games, often you need um, two types of advantage to, or two weaknesses you can play against in order to win an end game. Well, here that's one advantage for white, but the other thing is that black has weaknesses on this side of the board as well. And holding everything together is just too difficult. Rook a7 stops the pawn advancing. But you can see these pieces are now passively placed. And now it's time to squeeze on the other side of the board. Bit of shuffling first. White's rook still very active. Careful. Don't play rook d7. Don't offer that exchange of rooks yet. Just... Hold open the possibility. There's no need to plunge in with such a, a committal move yet. First, let's just advance on the king side. So you notice how Carlson just ensures that everything is protected. Rock solid. There's no rush. Don't rush. You've got a winning position here. E5. I don't like E5, I've got to say, because that opens up sixth rank, but also the d5 square is available for bishop and rook actually um i think it would have been better to keep the pawn on e6 but listen ultimately i think this is loss for black let's just make sure black is tied down here and the rook stays nice and active and king g4 so again a tough defensive decision for black do you allow white to play h5 or should you play h5 check yourself? The problem with playing h5 is that it's another pawn on a light square. And actually, it wouldn't really stop white breaking through. g4 could well come at some stage anyway. Um, and, and white will break through. Anyway, Aronian waits for the moment. 
Bishop d6, black just has to stay passive, and now the king is breaking through into black's position. So we've got two targets here, plus the c pawn, and this is just too much. So that attacks this one, the rook defends, and this was the final move of the game after bishop f5 threatening bishop d7, then Aronian resigned. Well, let's just continue for a little bit. So what would happen after rook c7? Well, let's lock the rook in here. Now, a second pawn is threatened. That will be two pawns up for white. And if bishop c3 defending the pawn, then rook d6. And yeah, that would take pawn number two. And that really is too much for black to bear. So understandably Aronian resigned yeah if well for example bishop d no bishop d2 isn't even possible <laughs> sorry that can just be taken yeah so basically rook d6 is, is just a winning move there well I thought that was a consummate performance from Carlsen a well-played opening strategically in the middle game he had everything under control and when it burst into complications he handled the tactics very well and managed to steer it towards this end game where he controlled play beautifully thanks for watching